What was the best army of World War II? This is a question that many people continually ask themselves, and its answer is not easy at all. The main reason is that many factors must be taken into account, and each country stands out in some points or others. From my point of view, the two main characteristics are the ability of an army to carry out the operations and objectives set, and the way in which it achieves them. Although the German army usually wins in every poll that is carried out on who is the best army in this conflict, we must not leave the Red Army behind. And it is that, and as we are going to see today, the Red Army since the end of 1942, carried out a series of operations whose genius was equaled or even above those of its German rival. The three operations that we are going to see next, are without a doubt the ones that won the Second World War, and the only negative point that can be put on them is that their execution method was not as clean as that of the best German operations. However, they amply fulfilled their stated objective, and as we have said, they won the war. These brilliant operations that we are referring to are Operations Uranus and Saturn in 1942, Operations Kutuzov and Ruminsafe during the summer of 1943 in the Battle of Kursk, and Operation Bagration in 1944. As we will see below, all these operations were strategically masterful and served to defeat what is considered by many to be the best army of all time. They were the closest thing to poker games in which both sides had to take huge risks, play tricks, and keep their composure until the end. The first of these was Operation Uranus, which allowed the entire 6th German Army to be surrounded along with other units in Stalingrad, adding a total of almost 300,000 troops. This trap began to be prepared during the month of September 1942, and would be carried out two months later, specifically on November 19. This was a very typical German maneuver, which during the previous year had been used again and again, to encircle and pocket large concentrations of Soviet troops. One of the most famous was the operation against Kiev in the summer of 1941, which ended with the capture of more than 600,000 Soviet prisoners. On the contrary, now it was the turn of the Red Army. However, the Soviet high command was not content with just defeating and annihilating the Germans at Stalingrad, for as quickly as they could they launched an even greater offensive to wipe out all of German Army Group South, and part of Central. This was called Operation Saturn, which began on December 16th of that same year, 1942. During this phase, the Red Army remained on the offensive pressing for a front of more than 400 kilometers simultaneously. This operation came close to encircling the entire German South Wing in Russia, and ending the war long before it did. This chaotic situation in which the German armies were unable to stop the avalanche of Soviet troops that were coming at them, was finally solved by Manstein with his famous counteroffensive in March 1943 in Kharkov. Although finally the front is stabilized, we can see as in general computations that from November 1942 to the beginning of 1943, the Soviets give a great blow to the Germans. So they returned them to their starting positions from the previous summer, and made it clear that they were not going to be able to make any further advances into their territory. With this, German hopes of victory over the Soviet Union were completely dashed. If you want to delve into this operation, I leave you in the description the program that we recently uploaded about this man's time counteroffensive. Next, we turn to the second great Soviet masterstroke that took place a few months later, during the German summer operation of 1943. As we have just explained, when Manstein's counteroffensive stops at the end of March 1943, this is how the new line on the Eastern Front stands. In it we can see the huge ledge around the city of Kursk, which will capture the attention of both sides. Both the German and Soviet high command had doubts about what to do next. His options were to attack immediately, getting ahead of his enemy, or stay on the defensive. After much debate, the Germans chose to attack and the Soviets to defend. However, the Red Army would not be limited only to staying on the defensive, as it devised a new strategy in which they would once again defeat the Germans. Their plan was to establish a series of defensive rings that protected the entire Kursk salient, in which they would have to contain the offensive that the Germans were preparing in the area. Once the best of the German army was bogged down in the sector, they would initiate a series of offensives attacking the German rear and its weakest flanks. 
Broadly speaking, the strategy was for the Germans to attack a central point where they would be weakened and stalled, and then attack them on their flanks. These offensives were known by the names of Kutuzov and Romayantsev. It is striking that the name used for these offensives is that of the former glorious generals of the Tsarist era, because with the arrival of communism in Russia, these had been discarded. Now, on the contrary, and faced with the need for the revival of national patriotism, many of these national heroes and traditions were rescued. The first of these Kutuzov-named offensives was launched on the rear of Model's German 9th Army, which was attacking in the northern pincer on Kursk. It began on July 12, just a few days after the German attack further south, causing the complete paralysis of Model's troops. We have to point out that in reality, Model had already paralyzed his attack because he had detected this danger. In any case, this first Soviet attack began to drive the Germans back little by little, until they had to abandon the entire Orel salient. This attack on the north of the Kursk salient was accompanied by another series of offensives that the Soviets launched in mid-July, and mainly from the beginning of August. The first of these were the Donetsk Muse offensives, which were carried out from July 17 to 24. In them the Germans saw their positions in the Donetsk Basin threatened, which was one of the reasons why the Operation Citadel was permanently cancelled. Later during the month of August, the Soviets began the Romayantsev operation, which pushed back the German army group south and lost the cities of Belgorod and Kharkov. The Red Army then continued to press along the entire front, until a month later they managed to reach the Dnieper River. During the series of operations that took place from July to September, the German army, far from recovering the initiative in the war, ended up losing it completely. Something that will be very striking and that we will see at the end, is the balance of casualties that will occur in each of these operations. Next on our list is Operation Bagration, which is again named after a former Tsarist general. This was without a doubt the great Soviet operation that ended up defeating the German armies that were still within its territory, and made Germany see that its end was very close, and it was going to be catastrophic. In order to carry out this large-scale attack that affected both Army Group North and Center, the Soviets had to use deception and camouflage their intentions. Let us remember that this operation was launched on June 22, 1944, once the Western Allies had landed in Normandy. This means that the German army was very weak on the Eastern Front, and no longer had the strength it had had in previous years, as the Western Front demanded more and more resources. Even so, the Soviet merit was to completely deceive the Germans, who did not know until the last moment where the main Soviet attack was going to come from. To do this, the Soviet High Command organized its attack in stages. His goal was for the Germans to send the largest number of troops to the east of Mink, to later launch against their rear and encircle them. Gradually the Germans were torn to pieces and could do nothing but fall back. By October 1944, most of Army Group North, which until a few months ago had been besieging Leningrad, was now trapped in Kurland. Further south, the Soviets advanced another 500 kilometers and managed to reach the outskirts of Warsaw by early August. By the fall of 1944, the Third Reich was hemmed in from both east and west, awaiting the final blow. Although, as we have seen, all these operations were impressive, there is one fact that always tarnishes them and that for many takes away part of their merit. We are referring to the casualties suffered in each of these offensives. To give some examples, during the Romainsafe offensive in which the Soviets expelled the Germans from Kharkov and Belgorod, the German army has about 25,000 casualties during these defensive battles, while the Red Army suffers about 200,000. During the combined operations surrounding the Battle of Stalingrad, Soviet casualties also doubled those of the Germans. Even in the most spectacular operation of all, this being Bagration, Soviet losses were again greater than those of the German side. This brings us to the next question as we raised at the beginning, and it is that although we have an army with a great capacity to launch operations and achieve objectives, we have to pay a very high price for each one of them, which luckily they could afford. Well, so far this program in which we have made an analysis of the most brilliant operations of the Red Army, which were very elaborate and ingenious and won the game over the Germans. We say goodbye here.
Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.